All right, everyone. I don't normally like to start the first day of a new unit out in Google Classroom assignments or virtual learning, um, but with winter break coming up, there really just isn't a way around it, given the way the calendar has fallen. So here it is. Here's the first day of our um, first um, chapter in Unit 3, which is on linkage institutions. And, you know, your first question of this week's um, lecture questions is, is basically just me asking you to recount um, what are the three major linkage institutions we have focused on. Um, they will be the ones that we talk about in this unit, um, and they are the ones the AP exam and the College Board focuses on. They're not the only linkage institutions, um, but if you remember, a linkage institution is any um, organization um, that links people to the political process, that links people to government, that links people to the policy creation. And for our purposes, as a reminder, they are media, interest groups, and political parties. And so we're going to start out with media today, and I'm going to admit before I even go to the, the first slide, and I know I'm talking a lot just as an introduction, that it's very difficult for me to introduce this chapter um, without also editorializing a little bit. I think we're in a pretty dangerous um, spot in our country with media, and I think that there's a lot to be rightfully critical of um, with regards to how our media works. Yet at the same time, I would say it's scary to me as a history teacher that we appear as a society to be venturing to a place that's sort of what I would call a post-truth society, right? One where basically nobody believes anything that the media says. And so the fundamental responsibility of the media, which is to you know, provide a check or a safeguard or shine a light into dark places to reveal for the people you know, abuses and things that are happening, if we can't trust the media at all to serve that role for us, then democracy ceases to exist. And so with that introduction, let's go ahead and begin. Um, and maybe how we got to this place of how we have um, grown increasingly distrustful of the media, um, which again, I will say is, is very scary as a history teacher. Um, the question is, how has the media landscape changed over the decades? And so, you know, we need to begin by saying that for much of the early part of our country's history, the symbiotic relationship that existed between the media and government was kind of a you scratch my back, I scratch yours sort of thing. It was a very, I use the word cozy relationship, right? Where the government would, you know, give stories to the media that would help them sell papers and get television viewage. And in exchange, the media would give sort of friendly coverage and, and write the things the government wanted written. Um, and this cozy relationship between the press and government really came to a crashing halt with the Vietnam War um, and Watergate, right? Um, and you can kind of in, ex, sort of guess why, but with Vietnam, with Watergate, media outlets, you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, major newspapers, same San Francisco Chronicle, Philadelphia Inquirer, Chicago Tribune, all sort of looked at themselves in the mirror and said, we can't continue to just trust the government and report on the things they want us to report on. We need to actually use our um, our, you know, our checking power um, uh, with integrity. We need to shine a light on the abuse of government. And this gave rise to the, the rise of investigative journalism, right, where, um, you know, newspaper outlets and journalists and began to check politicians' statements for accuracy. Um, and this also sort of mirrored um, the rising public cynicism towards government, right, oh, around the same time that the media was growing distrustful of the government and covering them in a much more antagonistic way. We also started to see the public view the government that same way. And I think it's a real chicken or the egg scenario, right? Did the media getting distrustful and cynical towards government cause the people to get that way? Or did the people getting that way push the media to be more cynical and, and, and really distrusting and investigative? Um, and so from this point on, we started to see that, that coverage of candidates' policy positions um, 
sort of started to fall behind and the media started to really cover the campaign um, almost as sort of like a sporting event, right? And we're going to see this term in, in our course a lot because the college board favors it and it tends to show up a lot of places. But we started to see um, this phenomenon develop where, you know, it was newspapers at the time and then it was television and now it's the internet where basically major media outlets are starting to cover campaigns, like I said, as a sporting event. Where instead of talking about what candidates stand for, what they believe, or what they're going to do, we start to say, like, who's up today? What are the polls showing? What are they doing? Like, what are, what are the sexy bits of the political campaign um, that make it interesting to watch? Who's winning? Right? And, and this... Um, this way of covering government and candidates does tend to result in less favorable images of candidates getting out there, right? If you're focusing on who's winning and who's losing and who's rising and who's falling, um, you get a lot of negative coverage of candidates, right, for their mistakes and their gaffes and, you know, what they say that's hurting them. Um, we have also seen um, over, uh, especially the last 20 years, but really in your lifetime, it's it's catapulted, um, the sort of eroding of market share and the complete collapse almost of print media, right? When I was growing up, and I'm not even that old, but when I was growing up, newspapers were still somewhat important, right? And when my parents were growing up, they were very important. Um, I would be surprised if any of you in this class have actually read a newspaper in the last six months. Right. And so print media, even magazines and, and things that you can touch and you can hold in long form journalism um, where, you know, every story doesn't need to be told in a 20 second snippet. Right. But really a page after page after page, a real deep dive into the truth. Um, this has faded. Um, we've started to see newspaper readership, you know, from the 1970s, um, meaning, you know, one in every two people read the newspaper. Now it's one in every five. And I actually expect it's even worse than that now. That's an old statistic. I would say it's probably one in every 10. Um, and this has pretty dramatic impact because when newspapers were, you know, selling a lot and, and popular, the money that would be generated through their daily sale would support giant newsrooms, right? Where the New York Times and, and not just the New York Times, the New York Times could still do it, but smaller papers could afford to employ, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of journalists um, who, you know, were based around the world and tasked with finding out the truth and investigating things and doing all that stuff. Um, but as these newspapers have closed due to declining revenue and advertising revenue, especially, we've seen newsrooms get basically canceled. And we have less journalists today than we ever had before. And that's, that is, again, a problem for democracy, because journalists serve a pretty critical role in democracy to keep government accountable, right, to to write the things that people need to know, so that we can make educated votes and decisions. And so this loss of revenue has led to less professional journalists. And again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna beat around the bush. I think that that's a big problem. Continuing forward, we have, you know, we're going with the the diminishing of um, print media, we've seen the rise in power of electronic media. And, you know, this started in the 1960s um, when, you know, Walter, Walter Cronkite and um, I, I, like oh, Edward Murrow and all these um, people, you know, NBC News and CBS News and ABC News, these network news were kings, right? They, they were basically the biggest celebrities in our country. They captivated the American um, viewing, like, what, demographic every night. And, and as that has diminished, we've seen the rise of 24-hour news cycles, right, where CNN literally is showing news 24 hours a day. So is Fox News. So is MSNBC. And I want you to think about that because if you have to show news for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, think about the impact of that. Like they basically manufacture stories in order to have new things to talk about, right? Or they play up stories and turn what is a mild or moderate event into a major one because that's good for their viewership. 
We have also seen recently a rise in what we call specialized channels um, that has really fractured the landscape of how we get our news. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, it used to be <clears throat> a thing like CBS Evening News was <coughs> was put together to target the bulk of the American people. It was what we call broadcasting. It had to appeal to a huge swath of America. It had to appeal to nearly everyone because that's who it was going out to. But nowadays we don't really have that. Now it's 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 highly like niche or or specialized where Fox News has basically saying we're only going to show news that really conservative people are going to want to see or MSNBC is going to show we're only going to show news that really liberal people are going to want to see or OAN is even worse we're only going to show news that like you know white supremacists and alt right and you know neo nationalists want to see and so we started to see all these different places where people get their news fracture to where we no longer have broadcasting, meaning news that has to be put out towards the vast majority of American audiences. We now start to see narrow casting, and narrow casting is is when a channel or a program can instead of having to appeal to the majority of people can really zero in on what we call niche audiences or so niche audiences like small subset of the populations this is the news for racists this is the news for liberals this is the news for you know strong conservatives this is the news um for business owners and the problem with that is is it creates incredibly large echo chambers um and it it also basically reduces if if you are you know an OAN network and you know instead of the 50 million viewers every night that CBS evening news gets OAN is happy if they get 1 million viewers um they don't have the resources to re actually really fully cover the news instead they're basically the talk radio of TV they they talk about what other news outlets are are showing and then they pretend to be news themselves um and this has been a shift again in the landscape and the problem is is when we all go and retreat to our individual echo chambers an echo chamber is where we lock ourselves in a room and we only ever hear opinions and things that reinforce what we already believe um, that when we all as Americans lock ourselves in our individual echo chambers, we become entrenched in what we call, and this is an AP psychology term, which is selective perception. And in government, this idea means that we really only hear things that already reinforce what we believe, right? If we hear something that we don't believe, we just turn it or we tune it out or we discredit it or we say it's crap. And so we only ever want to surround ourselves with things that already push messages that we believe. And that creates sort of almost like mini cults all over. And this has made it more difficult for government to get its message out, right? Because you're no longer able to go on CBS Evening News or NBC News or Nightly News um, or ABC Nightly News um, and just kind of speak to the American people. You now have to go on 20 different news channels in order to get your you know your message across um and this has again also shifted the way that government and politicians respond they have watched all this happen and they have developed strategies on how to get their message across through the media to the people and remember media is a linkage institution how to make so media functions as that linkage institution and so they've you know increasingly focused on what we call staged media events which is where you call the news stations and say at three o'clock today i'm going to be at memorial park you know protesting this thing and i'll have all these signs and send your cameras here and make sure you record me doing this because i want that image of me on tv so next, um, and before we go into the second thing, we're, we're going to look at what is, or the, the second part of today's lecture is, what is the government's role in managing media? And this has changed as media in our country has expanded, right? In, in 1934, in the post-World War I years and before World War II, when, when you know, radio was starting to rise before the age of television, the government realized um, that they needed a federal bureaucracy to really regulate um, media, to regulate, at that time, it was the airwaves. Um, and 
you know, this was basically designed to make it so that 94.1 didn't just boost the power on their antenna and bait up, basically eat up the frequencies for 94.3 and 93.9, right? They regulated the use of the airwaves so that it was serving the public interest. I'll pick up in part two.